Daniel Mroz is now the most uh, featured person on this martial arts studies podcast. We we did an interview a while back, and then um, I podcast one of his presentations at one of our conferences. And today we're going to talk about um, things differently, aren't we, Daniel? <laughs> nice to see you again. How are we doing? I'm all right. It's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so last time, last time we talked. Um, the recording went wrong we dropped we lost the internet connection so we talked for half an hour and the internet connection fell out and then i didn't have the editing skills and i lost the recording and everything this time we've just talked for i think maybe 25 minutes and you thought that we were recording but so, <laughs> so this time it's like every time we have a false start of some kind um but you the thing that precipitated this discussion um today was your article on Tao Lu in the journal Martial Arts Studies, which I, which I hope to, to get to, I hope that we can solve the riddle of Tao Lu once and for all. Um, but you wanted to talk uh, about some new thought experiments and new approaches to, to combining different, different problems and, and coming up with some new hypotheses, right? Would that be a fair yeah. representation? <laughs> so For sure. Um, I, I guess I'm also trying to represent to myself how I do thinking to speak yep. really plainly. And also that, you know, in the humanities, I think we are really tolerant of things that are considered, would be considered speculative in other disciplines. Yeah. And I just had a very long conversation online with a friend of mine at the other university here in town who's a cognitive science professor. And some of the, the parameters that he feels are suitable and the parameters that I feel are suitable for having a reasonable conversation is really quite different. So uh, yeah, I was thinking about how we make meaning and uh, I there's a uh, celebrated, maybe slightly 70s uh, person, uh, who may be a logician who now works in the private sector uh, named Edward de Bono. And I mm -hmm confess I've read a lot of Edward de Bono's books, but I don't know much about him. The books are very, very lean and they're kind of, just try this. This is very um, almost schematic exercises in thinking. And one of his descriptions uh, in the book with the whimsical title of Five Thinking Hats is um, how do we define creativity? And the way he defines it is say, well, it's our ability to relate uh, laterally across asymmetrical sets. And, you know, this is like a little bit technocratic and, mm -hmm. you know, makes people who don't know about math nervous because it must be true, it's math. But there's a, uh, I, I did a little, I made a PDF to uh, <laughs> try and right. demonstrate so, what he means by this. Okay. So I'm gonna, yeah, I don't know if the screen shares is You it on? should be able to share. No, you should. You can share the screen. Oh, I mean, actually, we I have to talk off, through it because yeah. some people will watch this on YouTube and other people will listen to it on their on their devices. Oh, well. oh. so you know, then maybe. Talk, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll 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 do the visual quickly afterwards. Okay. So, the this notion of relating asymmetrical sets. I feel like the degree of asymmetry in the humanities, like the degree that we're willing to tolerate, is perhaps the most, the, the, the largest degree. And as we move across the disciplines, the degree of asymmetry uh, becomes a liability to the kinds of knowledge claims. And so we're trying to actually remove that uh, asymmetry as we get closer and closer to something that we might think of as, as more empirical. Again, I could be mistaken. And there's a theater artist who uh, is often quoted um, named Robert Wilson. And he described this ability uh, to generate meaning through coordinating between asymmetrical sets in the following way. He said, well, if I take a Baroque candelabra and I put it on a Baroque table, the whole thing kind of vanishes into a general mm -hmm. aesthetic of the Baroque. But if I take a Baroque candelabra and I put it on a rock in the middle of the ocean, then we can see it, in his words, as it is. Okay. And so this pattern switching, if you will, or ability to coordinate across patterns, I feel is 
very, very inspiring and useful. And I can, you know, using examples like the Robert Wilson or uh, the, the visual thing that uh, we're not going to do because this is a podcast, but uh, using simple metaphorical examples, I can indicate to collaborators and, and to students that the kind of nature of speculative thinking that yields creativity. And mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I was thinking about, so we've got asymmetrical sets. The other side is um, our colleague D.S. Ferrer's uh, great idea where he came up with these notions of false connection. And he was talking about it in terms of martial arts, in terms of S Singapore society. Mm -hmm. But he, I think he was contrasting people who were doing uh, Tao Lu and demonstrating an awful lot of martial prowess. Mm -hmm. And then when he uh, you know, fought with them, they did not demonstrate very much martial prowess <laughs> and he felt there was a, uh, a disconnect between what was being the value being given to these presentations and to people's titles as I am a martial arts teacher and the actual ability that that referred to. So there was a felt there was a false connection there. So if we think we've got sets that are asymmetrical and we're making connections and that's creativity and then the other side is we've got sets and we're making connections and they're actually a little bit delusional or seen certain ways they are they're productive of further questions mm -hmm. like in Doug's case you know what are why are people doing these martial arts because they certainly aren't using them to fight yeah and yeah so I started to generate a whole pile of uh possible topics using this, uh, you know, is it, you know, a creative connection or is it a false connection? Or, you know, is there, what's the distinction between, or if we look at something as a creative connection or we look at it as a false connection, how does that work? And the first one that occurred to me is uh, due to the, you know, one's preoccupation around figuring out the relationship between Chinese cultural history and Chinese military history with respect to the artifacts that we now have called Chinese martial arts. Yeah. And uh, the, the one of the martial arts that I practice, the uh, Tai Chi Chuan, which, you know, comes from a, a whole unknown, but kind of known history and seems to get synthesized in Beijing in the uh, 1850s. And who is doing it? And we was not entirely clear who's doing it, but there's this wonderful French scholar and practitioner named uh, uh, José Carmona, and he may pronounce it Spanish, which would be José Carmona, but uh, I'm not sure. And uh, he's written a beautiful book in French, uh, La Transmission du Taiji Chuan. Mm -hmm. And he's a very, very capable speaker and reader of Chinese, including older Chinese. So he describes how, from what records are available, sometimes in secondary sources, like somebody cited something, mm -hmm. uh, the bulk of what became Taiji Chuan was developed by a bunch of Manchurian fusiliers who were called the Shenji Ying, which is the, the divine mechanism, the gun. And they had hired, and this is where it gets a little mysterious for me, they hired a someone who is a much lower social standing to be the martial arts tutor or fighting tutor for their little group. Yeah. So this is like in their private lives. Yeah. And so, but private, perhaps different con con conceptions of privacy and what's professional, what's private. But the, uh, the outcome of this is we see that really, really tough people you know, who you know, had guns and you know, they were mentoring and they wrestled, they shot arrows, they could ride horses. Sometimes they even had bullets. And uh, these guys uh, were hiring someone to come in and be their coach. So they're already tough. And so the false connection, I think, uh, is that we think of martial arts now in our kind of, the, the brands of martial arts that exist are sources of toughness and in you know media like every film there's the training montage you know oh, yes. the person 
you know, is from weak to strong. Um, there's, you know, things that apparently aren't, I don't, someone who knows about judo should say this, but like presenting Kano as being uh, the founder of judo is like, oh, he was a weak young man. And apparently like, maybe he wasn't, but you know, there's this, this narrative that the martial art is actually gonna change you into a tough person or a resilient person. Whereas I think the history, a more productive way of looking at it is like these martial arts are outgrowths of the serious leisure of people who are already tough. Yeah. And what I do like about this is it kind of works across the board because if we look at the uh, the the Chole Foot um, Futsan uh, Hong Sing school that I talk about in the in the article uh, that in in martial arts studies that used a lot of Ben Judkins research on that period. So those people, they're already very tough. Mm. And then they do this. Mm-hmm. And so maybe it's an expression of leisure. Maybe it's a like skill refinement as uh, tough people who are learning to fight. And we have, it, so it, it seems to work in a lot of places. It seems to work in Beijing where we're talking about you know, this Manchurian elite squad of people. There were members of the Manchurian nobility in it. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, the social strata that, mm. you know, almost no longer, or social distances that almost no longer exist in the, our parts of the world, at least. Yeah. So, so there's a kind of this reversal, I think, is is really helpful. And there's an American School of Sociology. I don't know much about it, but it, it I've been reading. It seems very nourishing. Is uh, this idea of serious leisure that people do things with an incredible intensity, mm-hmm. and they are not necessarily going to produce a kind of jovial or immediately gratifying um, outcome, but it's not the people's profession, but it's intermingled with the profession. Or yeah. The yeah. profession exists to fund it. It reminds me of, um, so we, you know, our mutual friend, Graham Barlow, right? So Graham talked, like back in, back in the olden days when we were just, we were just nobodies and we weren't famous because there was no real, <laughs> there was no internet like this for nobodies to become famous for no particular reason. Um, and he we, he taught me Tai Chi and Chai Foot and um, and and we would go through applications the applications of different moves from the from the Tai Chi form, and we would sometimes laugh going like yeah it w- it would work, but you'd have to be so good already to make these applications like work in our real situation and that was kind of out the line that we sort of spontaneously arrived at was like. Yeah, it works, but it's so preposterously difficult to do that you'd already have to be that person who was so incredibly brilliant at fighting that this was nothing. This was extra. This was, you know, you're mm. fighting someone who's already easy to beat anyway. I mean, it really, mm. it really chimes with that. But I guess the other thing that you might be more interested in taking up is, is um, it, I'm thinking when you're talking about a few things around connection and false connection, um, and I remember, you know, we go back to um, Sigmund Freud, and this is kind of the origin of, of what um, D.S. Farah is talking about. And one of the first criticisms of one of the first criticisms of Freud was made by his, his colleague Fleiss, uh, who argued that psychoanalysis was basically just wit gone wild over ingenious analogizing lacking the neck i think this is a quote actually this is a direct quote probably in german first but that psychoanalysis is just wit gone wild over ingenious analogizing lacking the necessary discrimination and that like how do you how does psychoanalysis justify the connections that it makes and this is a problem that kind of infects the whole of the arts and humanities really how do you how do you interpret this this way how do we in what's the the strength of the connections that we're making, false connections or creative connections, or like how can we justify our interpretation of Tao Lu? How can we justify our interpretation of the applications of the forms? You know, how, how do we interpret anything? Is there any strong guarantor uh, of, of our interpretation? Or have you thrown that whole thing out and you just go with creative connections? Um, I think, no, I, I so many thoughts at once i'm really happy to be wrong <laughs> um too uh you know because it's really it's, it's bound to happen so better get used to it the second thing i think it, i'm not 
the, the creative part is that I don't really imagine that one, this is, these are not problems to solve in the sense that you know, we're going to nail it down. A diamond always cuts a piece of glass, no matter what we call the diamond or the piece of glass. I don't think we're engaged in that kind of problem. And then the, the other part is a sense that we do have a lot of information and we shouldn't pretend we don't. So the, this is a little bit of a personal interest that the written material on Chinese religion in the last 30 or 40, maybe even 50 years has just, it's just blossomed. It's extraordinary. Mm. And some thought of context for understanding all the other, other or the intermingled cultural manifestations. So it allows us to understand how a certain body of literature was generated, what kind of influences are determining what's being painted, how theater is produced and uh, interpreted, and of course, um, martial arts. So we really have this great treasure trove and it would be responsible to look at it. So this is me being a little bit more uh, creativity, just do a proper literature review, damn mm -hmm. it. <laughs> like that is a very uh, important thing to do. And you know, like when you look at military documents, uh, this famous day, everyone's always like, oh, Gigi Guang invented Taiji, you know? Um, and uh, you know, you, I have his book upstairs. It's just lists. <laughs> so whether or not, you know, we, the lists never reveal the, the, the culture surrounding them. You know, if I, you and I play cards, the third party has no idea what the rules are. They can examine the cards. They're never going to find the rules. The rules are in the, the situation that envelops it. So my more strictly scholarly uh, point of view would be that, you know, how much information we actually have. Oh, wow, look. Or, you know, we, we don't have information, but in many cases we really do. And we, it's incredibly productive to, mm -hmm. to look into it. And then depending on, you know, how skeptical or what lens you're using, then you have your, the limits of your creativity and you know, what's speculative and what is, you know, really probably quite founded. And for you, this isn't just like interpretive creativity, is it? This is a kind of, that there's always a, a lived and trained and practiced dimension to it. So I'm thinking back to your article, which you, I know you worked on it obsessively through the, the summer of 2020 and, and, and we, we published it in, in late 2020. And, um, and it's, it was about the way you kind of obsessively lived the question of Taolu, the, the Chinese uh, martial arts sets and your relationship with swords and, it kind, and, and your relationship with space and, and, and your concept of negative space. And this was, a, this was a process that was creative and you're forming connections, but it wasn't simply kind of uh, logocentric. It wasn't simply words, was it? I mean, it was about living, living new connections to, to produce a new understanding that, that goes beyond words, right? I think the great challenge of doing anything that you know I personally <laughs> will find interesting uh, in written form is making that switch. How do you express something, or at least infer that it, there's an experience that without traveling too far from that experience? And so that was a major preoccupation of that writing was sort of yeah, in a way, here's an awful lot of history and knowledge that we have, and then here personal experiences and then other people's accounts that kind of match those personal experiences. And so bringing all that together is something that is very, uh, that's the obsessive quality. Like how do you, how do you actually express that so that people can come away with a clearer idea, not only of your experience, but of the, the whole context in which you're having that experience. And uh, something that as this is, is uh, one of my funny thought experiments that I've prepared 
for you today, but it, it really relates to what you just, uh, you just asked about. And I, I hope I can do this justice because it's a little bit disciplinary. It's a little bit into theater and dance. But if we look at the, um, the, the, the things that I'm talking about in, in the article in terms of how we, uh, the, the reversals, uh, first we you know, deal with trying to tame our body and put it into certain positions. And then we become aware of the, the feelings of the body in those positions. And then we project out in order to be able to you know, manifest our intentions and our receptivity into the space around us. And if we look at the preoccupations of uh, dance and theater training in the mid mid century, early century, all the way up to now, it goes through those phases. And it's just marvelous. So, like something that is very, very preoccupied with introspection and um, interoception would be the method acting, which apparently appears in New York. All these traumatized people could come over from Europe after the war. Psychoanalysis that you just mentioned is. Everyone is in psychoanalysis. It is the, I mean, everyone, I'm exaggerating, but yeah. there's an enormous number of people who are involved in the performing arts who are also in psychoanalysis and the methods start to blend. So this pretend it's real acting that is developed in the, in basically in New York and a little bit in California uh, in mid century is an entirely inward looking thing around the psychology of oneself and the character. And so that becomes the measure of the theater of that time. In dance, we see a similar kind of archetypal thing. If you look at the, this is a little earlier, but if you look at Martha Graham, there are all of these archetypal figures. So there, there is a kind of a story is being told. And you even go back to something like Str Stravinsky as a rite of spring. But uh, there's a, a real preoccupation with figures and the psychological or you know pulsional recognizability of these figures, and as we get into the 60s and 70s, uh, we move from like you know Jing the body, we move to uh, something more like Qi to energy, where people are like, there's a whole school of thought in the arts that we're still recovering from that the baby boomers kind of brought with them that I would jokingly refer to as free or id, the art will follow. You know, you don't need technique. You can this kind of pulsional um, thing. It's a play on George Clinton's yeah. very famous song. And um, so there, there's a, the introspection continues, but it's not a kind of character and psychological introspection. It's a bit less archetypal. It's moving towards something that we would recognize from, you know, Qigong and various kinds of alternative therapies of being aware of you know, energies in the body and the lines of energy and flow. And so it's a little bit more depersonalized and more primal. And then in the 80s and 90s, you start to have things that emerge into uh, a more spatialized kind of expression. And here I'm really it's probably shrinking the audience of people who know what I'm referring to, but there are a very, the most famous sort of American uh, actor training technique to emerge from that period is this thing called viewpoints, which is sort of a grammar of space. It was developed in contemporary dance and then adopted into the theater. And it is very much about creating a kind of extroversion and spatial sense. So I was really quite delighted that this um, sort of Jing Chi Shun uh, progression moves is it was sort of expressed in the you know the art forms that I uh, that I'm looking at all the time and that I you know work work in professionally in their history and of course I may be doing a force mapping you know I may be comparing two patterns and, and you know discovering them but it's a very pleasant uh, realization and uh, that I'll close with this. Uh, the way this is expressed in the, uh, the Himalayan uh, Buddhist tradition that has a lot of inter interaction with, with China, although it was more always trying to politically align itself with India, um, is there's the, you know, the very old school of Tibetan Buddhism. There are nine levels of achievement and types of training. And the number seven is you're basically visualizing yourself as an archetypal figure or a deity, and you're trying to transform your life accordingly. So you don't behave like you would behave, you behave like a special figure would behave. 
and you see everyone around you as part of that figure's retinue, even if they're doing horrible things to you, it doesn't matter because, oh no, I've transformed them. So this is Tantra. And then the next layer to that is you kind of make that figure into a transparent, basically humanoid, but that's it, uh, kind of, uh, visualization and within that there are these energy centers and lines and you're moving energy from one along the line towards a circle etc very very similar to qigong and then the last phase uh is this projecting out into space and experiencing oneself as spatialized and this is like maha yoga uh anu yoga ati yoga and uh again it follows this uh this progression so i you know, perhaps I'm just seeing patterns everywhere, which you know is our is our risk when we're uh, coordinating the way I'm suggesting. But at the same time, right now I feel it is quite fruitful. There you have it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mean, this is a this is quite a a, a meta a, a meta perspective on these on these these temporal and spatial connections i mean um so what how does what does it change i mean into, let's say for a a listener of this or a reader of martial arts studies or a practicing martial artist who, who's i mean what who who's interested in tao Luce, i mean what what might this does, does it change anything or does it give you something to hang on to or something to aim for maybe does it give you direction um, conceptually or i mean what does it what does it do one of the many things that i think are worth looking at would be that we can suffer from a kind of infinite internalization and this is in say if you play taiji and you have your taiji taolu and you know you get the structure and positions down and it becomes something that is easily accessible in memory there might be a tendency to go into the phenomenology and never come out of it. Mm -hmm. And we see that a lot in, again, I hesitate to sound too critical, but sort of baby boomer expressions of Taiji Chuan, especially um, in New York City at the uh, same period that uh, I'm talking about with the performing arts, where there's a kind of modeling of senile posture, there's an infinite relaxation, infinite introversion, um, any kind of proactive, uh, activity and push hands is deemed as well that's aggression you don't want to do that and so there's a that could just like that doesn't go anywhere you know past a certain point uh one doesn't necessarily become skilled at combat sports one doesn't have more to experience in one's talu mm. if you keep on going inward and you can start to produce an awful lot of strange fantasy so to project outward and to reverse the fine-grained attention to the inside of you to what what am I able to sense about my environment mm -hmm. while doing this activity? And how is that activity nourishing my ability to see what's actually there in my environment? Mm -hmm. I think that's what is useful. Now, I realize it doesn't sound extremely concrete, but uh, the more we get into like my main, uh, as an adult experience of, uh, I hesitate to say combat sports, but to mm. say play fighting is, uh, is, with, uh, is with swords. And of course, there's very few people in my area who actually know how to play Chinese swords. So I'm the guy with the Chinese sword and I have friends who are in this um, American Dog Brothers group, and uh, we get together. And there are people also who are recreating historical martial arts from, uh, from Europe. And so there's a kind of a mix of us who are, who are playing. And I feel that this, this spatial sense is immediately there, that you know, knowledge of range and you know, minute details mm -hmm. um, that are not simply felt within the self, in fact, as one relaxes and plays more and more and more, you can see yourself from outside and make adjustments to your position as though you're seeing it perhaps in profile, perhaps from above. But this is a 
extraordinary thing because you have a larger sense of the event you're in mm. and we're not actually modeling this kind of infinite regress and and self-involvement that in fact like the writing process that you were articulating earlier this logocentric thing uh can really produce like the, the my great concern all summer writing that article is i sat right here where you're seeing me right now and you know could only go out minimally and you know you, you spend four hours writing your body is substantially different mm. and your attention is substantially different i mean in what way is 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 what you're saying now different from a, a kind of a, a commonplace understanding of something like so if we do some standing qigong and, and you're standing in posture and you're and you're you know breathing and relaxing and it's funny as i say this because for a long time i was doing exactly the first stage of what you're talking about you know so so you know doing qigong uh, on and off but you know for protracted periods of time over several years many years and the commonplace understanding is that unlike certain forms of meditation, you should really be attuning your senses to what's going on in the environment. But I realized that I was spending a lot of time thinking about what was going on entirely within me, my posture, am I relaxed? How is the stance? Where, where would it, you know, every, everything inside. Can I feel any chi? <laughs> you know, all of these, all of these things. But what you're talking about is something that I'd kind of forgotten for a long time about Qigong practice, which is your awareness shouldn't be anywhere in particular, but it should be everywhere. It should be a, the, 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 the sounds and smells and senses and the everything and, and, and of the environment. Um, I mean, that's written in lots of places, you, you know, it, that, that difference between a form of meditation and, and, and part of the purpose of, of, of standing Qigong. Is, is that, are you saying something different? Is it something um the people get stuck where i was stuck for a long time and thinking only about my breath my dantian my my spine you know i mean what's the difference this was something that i, I went out for a little walk last night it was really snowy and uh, i thought oh, i'm going to talk to paul tomorrow morning i you know i just want to have a little quiet moment to think about what i might tell him and I was very stricken as I got to the end of the street where like everything I thought of, I thought was so interesting and clever and it's just so obvious. And so indeed, <laughs> um, as you say, uh, I do feel that some of the, the experiences of being able to have a field experience of the space you're in rather than an extremely local experience of your body it, or yourself, I think that is an unusual thing and probably very locally tactically useful if you play combat sports and artistically extremely useful if you're, for instance, a director or choreographer and you're responsible for coordinating a vast number of small variables in a single space, you can mm -hmm. perceive the space as a single unit. Um, you also have a, a problem solving skill or increase, you know, take the problem into your own body, process it, feel it mm -hmm. in the space, come back and suggest to someone else, why don't you try it like this? Yeah. So that's also part of the teaching advantage. Um, but I don't really think I'm, you know, it's, uh, someone can tell you something again and again for many years and you think, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah. then you actually have the experience of it. You're like, oh my God, this is like, <laughs> I found the holy teacup. And of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very straightforward, but the, um, but we do have a tendency to want to, to return to this logocentric idea that we, we want to nail something down. We want to mm -hmm. solve things. We want to, you know, and our, the, I don't really want to talk about it too much because it depresses the crap out of me, but the neoliberalization of education into like, everything should be a business. And so yes. we have standardization and we've standardized experience in a kind of multiple choice way. Yeah. So we come to think of, oh, knowledge is seven bullet points, yeah. you know? And this is a very detrimental to everything in our lives, obviously, but it means that 
you know, there's, there's more going on than just seven bullet points, but we want seven bullet points. And so if your experience of standing, for instance, produces seven bullet points, perhaps there should be a little bit of self-reflection about what that standing could be. Hmm. Oh, my phone's ringing. I, th I think it just, I might ignore that unless that's a, a bell ringing in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know like this is a you know this we the last conversation at the end you were talking about um you quoted bruce lee about his daily reduction yeah and i was you know and i just part of you know part of me is like oh no no it's like don't well, do that well, I was... <laughs> because you're actually you know you're turning things into the you know the or the a misunderstood daily reduction maybe, down to, down is... to one bullet point yeah <laughs> yeah and the, 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 you can't get experience into one bullet point. It's just not yeah. very. Feasible. I mean, there's, there's several things now in 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 the mix. I mean, one of the things um, that you're talking about uh, it it really rings a bell. So after after many years of, of of religiously going to Tai Chi lessons and 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 training and doing extra extra push hand sessions with people and doing Chai Qi Gong at every opportunity, like you know, a gap in between meetings, mm -hmm. I'd be. I've got 20 minutes I can and 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 kind of totally confounded and bemused and befuddled by tai chi and and being humiliated every every week and then one day you realize oh it's always the same lesson it's always the same like the answer is always the same thing and it's like oh I just need to and and one day one day you can't do it and you know the words and next day you just can do it and it's like something happens like those words like seep into your technical ability and you and you and now you find yourself that you're saying these you no know, just relax your shoulders to just relax, just do this and relax and move like this and can you feel that there and and boom and look the person's on the floor and i'm standing up and and that's the end it's it's amazing isn't it the way that like it's the, it's always the same lesson it's not a bullet point it's 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 you could put it in a bullet point it might be seven bullet points um, but it just, it is astonishing that it, it's, it's, and by, by the time you've done Tai Chi for 10 years or so, it's like, you're saying to people, oh, it's incredibly simple. <laughs> it's when it takes you 10 years to like relearn this, this innate thing that you would otherwise have, would otherwise have been squashed out of your uh, conscious and unconscious abilities. I think some of the, also these, this is, to get back to the um, waving a pocket knife at you, the um, getting back to the, uh, the idea of serious leisure as being a kind of very profession specific entertainment mm -hmm. and a skill refinement thing. If you know, imagine we are very like this playing with swords recently has really brought this to the fore. We have the best equipment in the history of humanity. Like, you know, you can really, really fence with a heavy metal sword and your hands will be safe and you know like sure you can get dinged up but you can wear wonderful these gambesons the sort of historical martial arts gear it's incredible the the replica gem that are being made and if you go back to where you know there was no orthopedic surgery there were no antibiotics and uh you know protective gear for your hands was like yeah i've got two tea towels you know <laughs> so the uh this is a very very different uh yes. situation so it's going to produce exercises that if you already scuffle because you're it's your job or it's your fate because of your social standing then you can extrapolate the skill that yeah. something quite gentrified will use for hand roll in, in uh, Taiji push hands or something, you can extrapolate that. If you just do the forehand roll and you don't have the background yeah. of some kind of what, you know, we don't know what is the degree of friction you're experiencing, but you don't have that, then there's the side of our modern mind, which is a little too functionalist, uh, is like, oh, that's kind of useless, throw it out. And then, but the, I suppose my experience has been to like not having much, you know, 
fighting in my upper middle class life um, until electing to do combat sports or martial arts with friends. Um, what do you, what if you take those things seriously and see what they produce? Mm. So in fact, why were these things kept? Why were Taoloo kept? Like, yeah, they're challenges. Like they're mm. very, very, uh, you know, can you remember this much? How, how deeply can you, you know, <laughs> excavate a, a single move? But ultimately it's, they were probably kept because they, they had some kind of very, very interesting fruition. And yeah. it's like a, a chong gong, like long work kind of fruition and those things don't get bullet pointed very well yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I mean, this would yeah no there's so much to pick up there so you when you're talking about serious leisure and mm. you picked up the concept from from american sociologists i mean i remember reading um a book was, i think the book was about Deleuze and derrida i don't know and 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 it was the first time I, I read the kind of the etymology of, of, of scholarship, the word scholarship. And it, it comes from it comes from the Greek. I might be making a false connection here, but from what I remember of reading this book 20 years ago, um, scholarship comes from a, the, a Greek word like some like scholae from which we get school. And it has a sense of leisure. It's that which you do after the day's work is done. And, mm -hmm. and after you have finished working, if you're a cultured, civilized person and you have the, the affluence and the means to, to have this disposable time, you better yourself through scholarship. And, you know, it, as we know, when we talk about Greek society, a lot of that involved things like, you know, wrestling and so on, but also and military skills. But but also scholarships like as scholarship is serious leisure time. That's what scholarship is. It, it's it's a culture that or a person who has the extra time to seriously use their leisure time to think philosophical questions or solve scientific riddles or, or uh, you know, or work out how to fight with live blades without killing themselves or killing their, their partner. I mean, these have got to be connected, right? And cu culturally, they have, there has to be some kind of connection between these two realms or more realms. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you describe this, is, this sounds really, uh verboten in uh, in neoliberal realms but like that's really supposed to be i don't know about you but my contract that's supposed to be 40 percent of my job yeah right is research yeah. which is you know if it's scholarship then we can you know gradually abstract it back to serious leisure and that's you know very hard to attain i don't know if anyone's actually doing that i think they're squeezing it in on top of all kinds of other responsibilities but the the that was an interesting thing to hearken to your your editorial about the pandemic and what it made you feel um i in a way like this sounds paradoxical but the the six weeks of peace where i could sit there and write Mm. was blessed you know and i didn't you know i didn't take a sabbatical i didn't schedule anything like it was just oh mm. everything's gone quiet mm -hmm. and so in fact when i stopped receiving or stopped processing in a lot of not very finally relevant or helpful uh information i had the space to focus and so this again is this you know like uh, or, um, you know, like, I don't know, I broke something at some point in my body, so my shoulder's always going to be a little off. And like, I could just be neurotic about that because I'll never, you know, I'll never look as good as that picture of Wang Shang Jai. So that's not really useful information. Eventually, you know, we can create circumstances that allow us the space to, mm -hmm. to really think. And this is, I suppose, like, I, I was having this with them. Um, Sorry, Paul, there's a point to all this. Uh, I'm teaching the second year Francophone uh, acting students. I'm their movement teacher, and I'm teaching them because when we planned this, the pandemic was really raging, and we didn't know what we'd be allowed to do. So I'm teaching them Chinese swords. So they're wearing masks, fencing masks, gloves, and we've got these polypropylene gen. And uh, and the uh, the preliminary exercises involve, you know, standing with it 
I'm just trying to figure out how to see yeah. my hand. You know, you try to, oh, this, that looks terrible. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but you know, you're standing in profile and you want to yeah. try and balance it vertically so that you're, you're experiencing the least load yeah. and that as though that we're full of water and the water is dropping down into the handle. So you're, you know, you're really balancing it. And then you know, there are basic wheels and cuts and so on. And my experience has been that this just naturally produces silence. Okay. Uh, a lot of the, uh, this is something I'm looking for. If any listen, if anyone ever listens to this, um, there was a South Asian um, cognitive scientist and she had this beautiful acronym for constant mental chatter. It was like constant, ever present, something, something, something. I saw it on the edge.org website, can't find it. But all of that mental chatter falls away when we start to practice these very precise geometric shapes with our swords. Mm. And I was really curious about where it would work on the students and where it wouldn't. And as soon as I asked them to start doing um, limited contact free play drills, mm -hmm. the more nervous ones would comment or chatter, or if they had to present a sequence just before it, you know, these people are acting like they should never do this, but they do, they get these weird little facial expressions of nervousness. I'm like, where's that coming from? This thing is supposed to produce mental silence, which is the most useful thing we could possibly cultivate because it allows you to see where you actually are. Hmm. And so I'm really curious about how that, how is mental silence produced? Hmm. And where does it, things that I experience as producing mental silence instantly, like sit down in horse stance, instant mental silence, play a Taiji set, instant mental silence. But then when it, uh, when does it, when it doesn't work, what's going on there? Hmm. Do you it, think it will, does it work the same for everyone? Or, or I mean, in your experience, does it, so some students, they don't get it, or is that just because they're, still struggling with some fears and anxieties and worries about handling a weapon or or someone's looking at them or i mean what what would be the mm. conditions do you think that you would need to be and would the conditions that need to be satisfied be different for everyone or, or similar for people what do you think um you know i my cognitive neuroscience friend says you know the two kinds of people lumpers and splitters um i i i was Definitely, in, as a youth, <laughs> a lumper. Um, I may be, you know, in old age, becoming a splitter. Uh, so my, I thought that these were very universal type things, mm -hmm. and I just seen so many people have comparable effects. And then, you know, if I look at the parameters a little more, more closely, I must say I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, you know, it. The school where I learned chole foot was a, a hotbed of activity in Montreal for people who were already artists. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a mutual support uh, thing there where the class was three, three times a week for two hours. And the last half hour of the class, you had to just be on the floor and continuously practice the thing that you were working on, mm -hmm. like where you'd got to. And the teacher would come around and visit with people. And so everyone who did well in that class was a dancer or a musician because they already knew how to practice. Mm. And so, of course, there were other there were other kinds of people there, but especially the morning class, which was from 10 to noon, you had all sorts of people who had art jobs that were at night and they were in there and they were able to practice. And so perhaps a lot of my early experience of seeing like, my goodness, this very, very thorough, formal, physical and mental training has this enormous fruition it was because it was like being given to people who already had previous experience in a way they're like, I was saying, you know, the Shenji Yang were already tough. The artists already know how to practice. So if you say here, here's great practice structure, artists are gonna really eat it up. So to answer your question, I just don't know. I don't know anymore. And I feel like I, you know, I, but it's, all about teaching i don't know anything about teaching i'm, I'm like <laughs> it's interesting because and I, I want to um now there's a conversation that you and i have been having on and off over email and over whatsapp and things for a little while and it's what you're saying about 
what I'm what I'm hearing is that there's something intangibly but inherently rewarding in practice in that in knowing how to practice in and in that discipline so the people who can practice will at the, the, the of the last half hour of your Charlie Foot class the people who who whose life is already structured through discipline and effort in that in a disciplinary way can find a kind of intensity and a kind of possible mental stillness possibly I mean we're projecting we're guessing but that maybe people who haven't had it as disciplined a life um so such people can't experience it and this reminds me of what we're talking about because I've been reading as you know Peter Sloterdijk and I don't want to put you on the spot because I know you've read some a long time ago you maybe haven't had the time to turn to it again but this it, it really resounds like people misread Sloterdijk right people think Sloterdijk is really complicated but I think that if you have been involved in a kind of something that borders on esoteric or ascetic like something a bit intense that's meditative or tai chi ish or, or or maybe solo sword forms or taolu it i think he's talking about that i think that what what Sloterdijk tries to do in his rambling conversations with the history of western philosophy and his interest in india is talk about the kind of things that you're talking about now which is this um, not even a mystical experience, it's not even an esoteric experience, it's a kind of psychological state that is produced through, um, he talks about gymnastics and acrobatics, but just a kind of intensity. That and I think a lot of people who've written about martial arts in different ways have tried to get at this, and I think this is a lot of the effort of people who are writing about these experiences. I mean, as someone who works in theatre and performance, you probably are aware of a vast literature that I'm not, of people who are talking about these different states produced through discipline, produced through effort, produced through practice, possibly with a live blade and therefore threat of injury or death, um, really intensifying the situation. But I mean, what do you think? I don't, you don't have to go after the slot dike if you haven't been reading any as intensely as I have, but um, <laughs> about this, this, this shared kind of understanding or insight that people who live an intense disciplinary life whether that be two hour class three times a week or whether that be a musician's life or, a, or an actor's life or a martial arts life or a tightrope walker's life I mean am I or a juggler's life I don't know mm. um I think I've read one and a half uh <laughs> Peter Sloterdijk books there's you must change your life is that the yep yeah, and then there's the one you just recommended to me because of its uh, the little quote about religion. And uh, I'm called to mind, again, this is a bit mean, but a um, but very famous scholar of Western studies, Christopher Skipper, who was uh, Dutch, but worked in France and then went back to Holland and then actually like, was living in Fuzhou, I think, in, uh, in, in Fujian province in China. Um, he just died, but some clever person has a whole pile of his lectures on YouTube, and he's discussing the our misconceptions of Chinese religion and how what we're not seeing uh, in terms of this cosmology of Tao and Yin Yang, and how they're in the culture everywhere, and there is no border to that. So many many things can be included in that. Anyway, he's giving this wonderful praise. And so I thought of your, uh, the, the piece you sent to me, where he's essentially describing that we don't have appropriate words for the embrace of these practices, because the practices have kind of diminished in cultural relevance, and perhaps they were always a little bit marginal. And so the language around it would fall into religiosity, and this is kind of referring to something a little bit different and needs to be you, know, you always need to unpack it so you're speaking to a smaller and smaller audience the other thing it makes me think of is i i keep this i heard this is what tech people do i have no idea if it's true um you keep a single word file on your desk and you put everything in that single word file so you can say that again it. sorry so could you could you just all ideas going. say that last bit again you a single yeah. word file you keep a single word file of what a single word processing file like microsoft word file open on the desktop and then every idea I have I put in there ah, okay, for years right. so I can search it yeah 
And um, there's probably better ways of doing this, right? But this is you know, an extremely uh, simple thing. And I went through mine and like, it's like, I was like 14 years old. So I, I went through this document and I made a sort. So what I'm collecting are like training methods, like exercises in a variety of areas, um, kind of principles, like, you know, you know, use efficiency, don't use brute strength. There's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just some kind of guiding thing that isn't an exercise. Yeah. Um, cosmologies, like you can imagine that there are five phases and that things have positive and negative qualities or these kind of older religious views that, that aren't about uh, devotion to deities, but are about, you know, how, how nature is structured. So yeah. cosmologies. And then finally, like, something somebody told me about someone so anecdotes or things that happened to me like the time the extraordinary will of the tour is like brushed my belly like that hard and you know did that dimak kind of thing and i was like doubled over in agony came over and rubbed my back and it went away and like i've never met anyone else who could do anything remotely like that and he's like you know he's a bit smug he's like you have to know where the blood is i'm like yeah dude i guess you do um but uh you know there's so there's like anecdotes of you know the martial arts teaching tales that's a particularly succulent one but like there are so i, I just got these four categories and so like everything i've been putting in this file for years and years and years is you know methods principles cosmologies and anecdotes and that is something where slaughter dykes comments like what's practice how do we recall practice where do we put practice yeah i feel like well i've managed to divide it into these four things <laughs> and so i feel like when when i yeah right like when he's i read him i'm like oh that's my <laughs> that's my word file that he's talking about in many ways or how do i share that if i shared that with you you'd be like great dan you sent me gibberish uh but if i <laughs> you know if i wanted to share that with someone what's the process yeah What's the, the the thing that would make it all snap into into focus for someone, make it make it communicable? I mean, this is this is what we've been talking about for almost an hour now, and and this is my way of signalling that I tend to try and keep these um these episodes, these podcast episodes, to within an hour. So I think we might be okay. out of order, but it's about, I mean, the, the the shared kind of problem of 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 communicating. You've, you've, you've been talking about this in different ways, the shared problem of communicating. So you hate the bullet point, like what are the learning objectives of this module? Ah, and people hate that, don't they? But also, but there is a real, there is a real question of like, what might you actually learn if mm. you devote your life to Taolu or if you do, or if you devote it to cultural studies or if you like, what might you actually learn? And the problem with the world is that we translate it into these utilitarian functional kind of fungible neoliberal values. But actually it still is a question like, what seed am I planting here? What is going to grow if I, if I devote myself to tai chi or should i do krav maga or should i meditate or should i or should i just be a, a hill walker i mean what like what will i learn <laughs> we need to, and and the fact that we can't know what we will learn and we can't communicate that often because we, you take you go to a different level of I'm thinking of that film now, was it called something like She, where the guy falls in love with his computer, essentially, a computer program. Mm -hmm. And then and then his computer has, is like an artificial intelligence computer. And she eventually falls in love with another computer. So she ditches him because she because he couldn't possibly communicate on the level that they're communicating. And it's like when, you know, Ben Spatz writes about the kind of fractal process of, of a field where if I go that way or that way, I will be unintelligible to myself, like th these these two options. I mean, we're, we're talking about all of this, aren't we, I think? Or this is what I'm p possibly projecting onto our conversation. What do you think? No, I, I think that's... Uh, you said so many great things. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, you know, agreeing with you in the most nebulous fashion possible. There was something that really caught my attention. Um, If one know this is a experience that I have and share with students an awful lot, where we are 
you know, sort of critical thinking writ large has been subsumed to a kind of justification thinking where, you know, if you get this grant, we'll be giving you money. So you better be doing something responsible with it. So uh, you have to be able to justify artistic choices. And of course, that's impossible because I don't need, if I knew what the justification for making an artistic choice was in the first place, I wouldn't need to make the art. Mm. So if you are proceeding in a, oh, I know what this is going to be uh, kind of attitude, it's, you know, maybe that's okay somewhere else, but it certainly isn't okay in any kind of creative process where in fact, you know, it's your process in search of a meaning, what is this going to produce? And so the, the confusion that, that you evoke is, you know, should I be a hill walker or should I be doing the Ido or, you know, like this, again, how do we, uh, engage with things with the idea that they're open-ended and they will inform us in ways we can't imagine mm -hmm. at the same time how do we avoid like branding and commerce mm -hmm. in, as a which you know commerce is fine as itself but as a, a source of neurotic uh compulsion mm -hmm. you know like oh i've got to do ninjutsu and i've got to do uh, hill walking and tea ceremony and ceramics and it's just uh, what you know uh, so this vast amount of options uh, which can drown us and make us want to have things just like there's so many options we want the options to justify themselves and then there's what i think is a more productive attitude as you know as an artist is well, i don't know what this is going to do therefore i'm going to follow a process that will in you know enlighten me about it at the same time that post this could lead me really far away and as you know ben evokes like if you wind up over there you will not yeah. be over there you've left the building you've you've really left the building if you and it's it, life is like this it, it, i mean that you've just touched on so many so many philosophical pedagogical lifestyle <laughs> paradoxes and problems that um we're going to have to just leave it there. We're going to have to leave it there and pick it up again. And you're you're going to be the most, the most conversed with, um, discussant and uh, interviewee on on the podcast. So, uh, but I am gonna I'm gonna call it I'm gonna call time on it there because I think that is about an hour. And that's you know that's that's any that's the length of anyone's commute to work, isn't it? I mean, an hour is is there and back for most people. So let's uh, let's really hope so. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Daniel Mraz, um, thank you ever so much for taking the time to talk to me again today. And I know we, we will talk again on this podcast and on WhatsApp and on Facebook and just as often as possible because it's always a delight. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Thanks very much, Paul. See you next time.